Okay, thanks very much. I, uh, I'm John Wall. Jake will come along later. If you will indulge me in just a, a short walk down memory lane. The first time I made a presentation, a technical presentation to the Air Resources Board was uh, around about 1982. Um, at that time, I was a research engineer at Chevron. We were looking at the effects of diesel properties, diesel fuel properties on uh, exhaust emissions. Uh, Kat Hookman, who some of you may know at the uh, Desert Research Institute, and I were, uh, were working together at that time. We got on to the effect of fuel sulfur, uh, the impact of fuel sulfur on particulate emissions. Uh, so I had a chance to make that presentation. Um, I met a young engineer named Tom Piquette. Uh, about that time, uh, Jerry Brown was the governor, and Mary Nichols was the chair of the Air Resources Board. Uh, so here I am 30 years later. Uh, Jerry Brown's the governor. Uh, Mary Nichols is the, uh, is the chair of the Air Resources Board, and, uh, and I just bought a house in Marin County about a year ago. So I feel like things are, uh, are coming back together again. Um, at that time, I didn't realize that, and as time has passed, that I, it has occurred to me that Tom and I might have been twins uh, separated at birth, but obviously my mom fed me more than, than his did after that, that time. So I'm very happy to be back and, and to really share you what, with you what Tom and I and thousands of our friends have been up to uh, in the last 30 years uh, as we have evolved diesel technology and the regulations uh, with them. So I'll talk about the, uh, the emissions technology, uh, the, the development of the new technology diesels, and then Jay will talk, uh, give you an update on our advanced collaborative emission study where we are looking at the first uh, animal study that has been done with these new technology engines. I think it's really important that we also recognize and celebrate the partnership that we've had together over time, that certainly regulations have the job of driving technology, but technology enables the regulations. Uh, and so it's been a very healthy uh, and strong collaboration. It is not without its contentious moments from time to time, but is in any case where you're really trying to strike um, the right balance among a number, of, uh, a number of things. If you're not feeling attention, you're not in the right place. Uh, and so we've been able to work very effectively together, I think, at, at striking this balance, uh, bringing along the technology, bringing along the regulations, and developing the, the new technology engines. Uh, first, a word from our sponsors. You know, it's, uh, it's very interesting for us to talk about emissions technology, and that's what I'll do for some time uh, as we're looking at uh, developing these engines. But we have to remember that the whole point of developing engines is for them to do work for our customers and the way we get low emission technology into the marketplace is people buy it. So while we get very wrapped up in low emissions, uh, we also have to keep in mind all the things that customers care about uh, when they're buying these products. And for these commercial vehicles, of course, these are business decisions that people are making. So it's got to be a good capital investment to replace the old technology. Uh, and that's what we strive to do. So as we have been working on technologies to deliver low emissions, we've also been looking at how can we increase the power, uh, how can we increase the fuel efficiency, improve the maintenance intervals, uh, make the engines more reliable and durable, and, and we've been able to do that over time. Certainly uh, since, since the mid-80s until today, um, We've seen pretty much a steady progress in engine efficiency. Uh, certainly with the recent engines, the engines that you'll see outside today, if you take time to take a look at them, the SCR engines are the most efficient engines that we've ever produced. And they're at more than 90% lower uh, NOx levels than when we started out at the very beginning. Uh, there are million mile engines where there were 250,000 mile engines at that time. Uh, the power density is almost double. Uh, what they were when we started all this out. So, so a lot of the technologies that we've been developing not only are good for emissions, they're very good for our customers. And that's one of the things that we consider as we're looking at how do we advance these regulations and how do we drive the technologies in the marketplace. So I'm going to really talk about two categories of diesel engines to make things easy. One, the, the traditional diesel engines, or the old stuff that, uh, that we were manufacturing when we started down this path and then the new technology diesels, and I'll get clear about the distinction for the new technology diesels as we go forward. I did think, just for a historical perspective, I pulled up this quote, so much has been written and said about the diesel engine in recent months that it's hardly possible to say anything new. And uh, that was uh, said by Rudolf Diesel in 1910. So I, we've, had, we've actually had a few more things to talk about since then. Uh, 
And I think you're all familiar at this point with the evolution of uh, the U.S. heavy duty diesel standards uh, over time from, you know, starting in the 19, uh, late 80s really and then moving on through. This just steps down from 1994 to the current uh, as we've been uh, moving ahead not only with particulate and NOx emissions but also with fuel sulfur. It turned out that as we got into the fuel sulfur and understood it better, in order to be able to meet the emissions regulations for particulates, it was necessary to drive the, the fuel sulfur levels down at the 3,500 ppm sulfur content levels that were typical uh, back in the late 80s. Uh, the sulfate alone was more than the particulate standards uh, that we needed to meet. And so driving the sulfur down really initially focused on, uh, on particulate emissions. Later, uh, as an enabling technology, for uh, oxidation catalysts, for NOx adsorbers, and for other technologies that we've been able to bring on uh, at the same time. And that's true both on highway and off highway. The nice thing about fuel sulfur is also it is a retrofit technology that hits the whole fleet at the same time. Uh, so you're not having to wait for new engine technology to make its way into use. Uh, when the fuel sulfur regulations change, all the vehicles benefited from that. Uh, and the atmosphere, about uh, the atmospheric particulate from fuel sulfur is uh, on the order of 15 times the particulates directly emitted by the time the SO2 is converted to particulate in the atmosphere. So that's been a huge benefit uh, in addition to the engine technologies that we've developed. Uh, we've worked on all systems. Now these are really the critical subsystems that, uh, that go into making a diesel engine, fuel systems, uh, turbochargers, uh, air control systems the electronic controls, the combustion research, the exhaust after treatment systems that have come into play in recent years. And all those where you can't say the phrase uh, system integration too often when you're talking about what we do and as, as we develop these technologies. And so all of these have evolved uh, over time uh, hand in hand with the regulations. And so this is just one way to look at it. Back, back when we started in the early 19, uh, really early mid 80s, there were a lot of different engine designs uh, in the marketplace. Two-stroke and four-stroke, uh, two-valve and four-valve, direct injection, indirect injection, uh, pump line nozzle, unit injectors, a wide variety of technologies that had grown up in different places uh, over time. As the regulations really began to converge, uh, transient emissions controls came into place. Uh, and by the early 1990s, the engine architecture had also converged on four-stroke engines, four valves, uh, centralized injectors, generally unit injectors, uh, and turbocharged and aftercooled in order to be able to control NOx uh, with, the, with the aftercooling while we were controlling the particulates. Uh, as we moved on, by 1994, uh, everyone was using electronic uh, control with fuel injection. We needed that additional control in order to be able to, to work the NOx and particulate trade-off. Many of you may know that uh, that typically those two trade off if you're just looking at very simple timing swings with the engine. If you do things to control the NOx, which is typically reducing the temperature during the combustion process, uh, that tends to make the particulates go up because uh, you're not burning up all the particulates that's made during combustion. So that's one of the balances that we struck. And with, uh, with electronic fuel systems, uh, that allowed us to be more subtle uh, in the control of the engine and how we schedule the injection timing uh, over, the, uh, over the engine cycle in order to be able to get the NOx and particulate to the levels that we needed. Then the 2002 time frame, uh, exhaust gas recirculation began to move in uh, to application. NOx control in an engine is all about temperature control during combustion. Uh, and so you saw stages as we were evolving up to this point of lower and lower uh, temperature uh, as the turbochargers were applied, the turbocharger compresses the air and makes it hot, so we went to after coolers to cool it back down again uh, so that you've got cooler engine air going in uh, to hold down the peak uh, temperatures. And the systems got more and more aggressive about uh, how they were controlling the air temperature, how much compression was going on outside the engine versus inside, and it was all about controlling the, the peak temperatures. By the time we got to the two and a half gram NOx standard, uh, you couldn't cool the air enough. Mm -hmm in order to be, and certainly looking ahead to 1.2 and, and beyond, you couldn't cool the air enough to really get the right balance. Uh, and so exhaust gas recirculation was used to take some of the exhaust and cooling it, put that back into the engine, 
Uh, and it sort of acts like dead weight during the combustion process. As the combustion is uh, taking place, it's got to reheat the, uh, the exhaust uh, that you've put in there. Uh, that takes some of the energy, it keeps the peak temperatures down and control the NOx emissions. It also makes it hard for fuel to find the oxygen it needs to burn. And so injection pressures went up at the same time. So with, with EGR uh, came along, higher injection pressures uh, uh, in order to be able to control the particulates. In 2007, now the particulate levels were so, now backing up again, you know, not quite as long a walk down memory lane, but when I first went to Cummins in 1986, we were working on particulate filters then, because we thought we might need them to hit 0.25 grams uh, particulate, and we were sure we were gonna need them to get 0.1 gram per brake horsepower hour. Uh, and of course, with the evolution of the combustion technology and the better mixing, uh, and atomization we were able to get with higher injection pressures, we were actually able to meet uh, 0.1 standard uh, without particulate filters. There were some oxidation catalysts that came in on, on some engines at that time, uh, but by the time we got to 0.01 particulate, uh, we needed particulate filters. Uh, and so that was a big step going to diesel particulate filters, and with that, typically oxidation catalysts, either on the particulate filter itself uh, separately or, or sometimes both. So it's that combination that came into play in 2007. And then in 2010, uh, selected catalytic reduction for NOx control to get down to the 0.2 grams NOx and be able to maintain the fuel economy and power density of the engine at the same time. Now the transitions aren't quite this uniform and clean. Uh, at each one of these transitions, there are some time where there's a mix of the older technology and the newer technology in the marketplace, and everybody has their own way of, of optimizing their business model internally and, and externally, but generally speaking, after a while, uh, these things shake out, and in the end, of course, it's not us that decide, it's the customers that decide uh, which one of these technologies that are, are doing the job for them. Um, so that's where we are today. After this, uh, the rest of the story, I think a lot of the rest of the story is going to be focusing on greenhouse gases, CO2, and fuel efficiency. I'll, you know, I'll come back in 20 years and Tom, we can talk about uh, CO2 emissions and how that played out. Uh, but the real revolutionary step along the way that distinguishes the traditional diesel technology from the new technology diesel is the one that happened in 2007. Uh, and that's the combination of ultra-low sulfur fuel and diesel particulate uh, filters with oxidation catalysts. Um, and that, you know, that really, I'll, I'll spend some time on that distinction. There were evolutionary steps, of course, along the way, and that's not to say people weren't working hard to take every one of these steps. Uh, but that was really the big thing, and the big watershed event that, that really changed the character, the chemistry, the mass of the particulate in the exhaust, and really changed, I think, the perspective on the health effects of the, uh, of the whole diesel exhaust at the same time. Uh, so let's talk a bit about some of these technologies. With the active particulate filter, typically uh, it's an extruded ceramic, uh, most often corierite, um, that you can imagine you sort of squirt it through, a mo I'm sure the people that do this for a living wouldn't appreciate the simple characterization, but you're squirting this out through a mall mold uh, and you, you wind up with a piece of ceramic that has the parallel uh, channels in it that you can see here. A little more detail, with, for the parallel channels that are in the ceramic, uh, they're plugged at alternate ends. So you can see there's a plug on the front end with the uh, exhaust flowing from left to right uh, of the upper and lower channels and the center channel has the plug on the right end. And the effect of this is that the gas flows into a channel and can only get out by flowing through the walls. And so that's why this is called a wall flow filter, a wall flow monolith, uh, as that construction. So as the, as the exhaust gas flows through the picture, the, the filter, the particulate is captured on the surface. Um, and with the oxidation catalyst, a number of other reactions, oxidation reactions are going on at the same time. Now, filtering the exhaust is not the hard part. It's getting rid of the, uh, the carbon once you've collected it. Uh, that's the hard part, so the filter doesn't plug up. Uh, and so that's why these are called active uh, systems, because periodically they need to be regenerated. Now for many applications, the exhaust gets hot enough, often enough, to kick off the oxidation reactions and incinerate the particulate on the filter. NOx is actually a very good uh, uh, oxidant. So if you see these particulate filters with SCR systems, most often, you'll see the particulate filter upstream of the SCR because you want the NOx to help regenerate the particulate filter and then you want to clean up the NOx 
when you're downstream uh, with the SCR systems. But in any case, you have to provide for the fact that we have to elevate the temperature. And this is also why retrofit technology, in particular filters, is difficult because you don't have all the controls built into the old engines. So it's not enough to just slap a filter in the exhaust. You actually have to be able to manage the regeneration event, either through the duty cycle of the vehicle or by some add-on devices that will add heat uh, in order to be able to regenerate the particulate filter. But these are extremely effective. The particulate standard changed from 0.01, or from 0.10 to 0.01 in 2007. Numbers that we see coming out of these particulate filters are numbers like 0.001, 0.002. So it is 10 times lower even yet than the standard because basically that's what you get. Uh, these are extremely effective filters. Um, so as you see the, the exhaust moving through, the reductions that we're seeing are more than 99% reductions in particulate. Uh, hydrocarbon and CO are oxidized uh, because of the oxidation catalysts that are present. Uh, CO is virtually uh, eliminated. In fact, if you look at the data from engines with the oxidation catalyst or uh, oxidized particulate filter, they're down in the noise uh, of our ability to, uh, to resolve in the, in the laboratory. And then the polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons and other compounds that have been uh, associated with toxicity are also reduced significantly, and I'll talk a bit about all of those. So that's the big deal. We, uh, as we made this transition, we were working on combustion, the air handling, the fuel system and controls, but it was really the addition of the exhaust after treatment and the ultra-low sulfur fuel that really gave identity to the new technology diesel engines. Uh, so here's where we're going to go with, uh, with some of the slides coming up. We've got, uh, we, we look at the particulate levels. I've also mentioned that they are uh, one hundredth or a one thousandth, uh, the level of the new technology exhaust. Uh, they are very comparable in mass emissions in both particulate and NOx to natural gas and gasoline engines. And I'll show you some data on that. For, for a long time, natural gas engines have really been held out as the clean engine, uh, the clean fuel. It is. Those are very clean engines. Uh, and then when we first started working with them, they were cleaner than the diesel engines. But with, under the new regulations and with the new technologies, they're very comparable. And I'll show you some of that data. And also, there's quite a difference in the chemical composition of the particulate with the new technology engines compared to the, uh, to the old. So here's some data that was uh, actually some bus data that was taken from a car study. Uh, just showing on the left, and this is just scale to uh, to 100 uh, just for on relative terms, so you can see the percent difference uh, from the baseline engine that was without a uh, particulate filter and after treatment to a series of engines that, uh, that had particulate filters, in some cases, selective catalytic reduction. And you can see that, uh, see the sorts of reductions that we saw uh, with the addition of those particulate filters uh, right down the line on the order of 99% uh, of reduction on average. Um, Here's some data from some Cummins certification data. So there are a couple of, couple of dimensions to this data. Uh, if you look at the two bars on the right, uh, those are a 1990 diesel engine compared to a 2012 diesel engine. You're looking at NOx in blue and particulate in red. Uh, and you can see the difference. Uh, the particulates are graphed as 10 times the uh, particulate level, just so you can see the bars on this chart. So the numbers that are sitting on top of the bars are correct. The bar itself, if you read to the scale to the left, for particulate is 10 times uh, the level of particulate. Again, just so you got a chance to see just a little bit of a bump uh, on, the, on the 2012 diesel engine. The bars on the left are natural gas engines. All of these are from roughly the same engine platform. We made a transition from 8.3 to 8.9 liter engine uh, at Cummins over this period of time. So the older uh, uh, CNG engine on the left is the 8.3 liter engine, the 1990, same thing from the diesel, and their nine liter engines on the right. But the rest of the engine platform, it's the same engine platform that was uh, modified slightly. Uh, and you can see on the left, uh, the CNG compared to the, uh, uh, the old and the new CNG and the, and the old and the new diesel. So, the, so there are a couple things here. One is we've actually made some pretty good progress with CNG over this time uh, in order to be able to, uh, to meet the emission standards. And two is that, you know, as you look at, uh, at the 2012 CNG engine, the 2012 uh, diesel engine, when we say that they are comparable, they really are comparable. And, and you can 
compare that to, uh, to what was going on back in the 1990s. These, uh, I also called your attention to the footnote uh, underneath the title where it says negative test results are set to zero. What that means is that we're at the limits of detectability for particulate, uh, and in some cases also for CO. So we will run a test, we'll measure the filter before and after, and there's so, so little material on the filter that the noise in the measurement will give us a negative number from time to time, uh, which we set to zero. So it really means we are at the limits of detectability. In fact, a lot of the investment we've made over this time, in addition to investing in the products, we've made a big investment in measurement technology just to be able to develop engines and measure them at these emissions levels and either with, even with that, uh, the particular that is, uh, is at or below the detectability levels. Uh, on this, this is the same chart, the bars have moved over a little bit on the left for diesel and uh, natural gas and just adds a couple of heavy duty gasoline engines. This is just data off the EPA website. So you can go there and look at the CERT data uh, for various engines and we picked up the Ford and General Motors heavy duty certified gasoline engines for 2012. And you can see that as you're reading across the natural gas, the diesel, and the two gasolines, they are, they are very comparable. Uh, if you look at particulate number, uh, which is another thing that we care about, it's, it will be a regulation in Europe. It's something that is being considered in the United States and it's certainly something that we think about when we're considering health effects of diesel exhaust or anything else that's uh, particulate suspended in the atmosphere. Uh, and you can see the substantial reduction uh, by order of magnitude without reduction, uh, without regeneration, a couple of orders of magnitude uh, from the traditional diesel exhaust to the new uh, diesel exhaust. And this is data that came from the ACES program uh, engines that uh, Jake will be talking about a bit later. With regeneration, regeneration is that act of burning off the particulate in the particulate filter. So that's a distinct event. We want to be sure we understand <coughs> what's happening during regeneration. This is largely sulfate emissions uh, because at the higher temperatures you can kick uh, the SO2 up to SO3 and, and generate considerably uh, higher levels of sulfate. Uh, and then this chart shows the breakdown of how the chemical composition has changed uh, over the period of time uh, from the traditional engines to the new technology engines. Uh, the left-hand left chart is uh, from some work that Dave Kittleson did back in uh, 1998 time frame, and the right-hand chart is data, again, from the, uh, the ACES engine. I would certainly call your attention to the bars in the middle before you start looking at the bar charts, because uh, even though we made the pie charts the same size, uh, the particulate level in the new technology engine is 98% uh, or a little more than 98% lower. Uh, than the uh, heavy duty engine that Dave was taking a look at. There are big, there's some big changes here that are uh, worth noting. The red pie chart, uh, even though it's maybe difficult to read, uh, the leftmost uh, on the left chart is elemental carbon. And you can see the significant reduction in elemental carbon from, um, from Dave's work or from the, from the traditional diesel engine to the new technology diesel engine. Uh, you'll also see that the percentage uh, of sulfate has increased substantially. Again, these are extremely low levels of particulate with the new technology engine, so the absolute level of sulfate is considerably lower, but the contribution, the percentage contribution of particulate is much higher uh, in these. Uh, and then finally, the organic carbon content uh, is lower if you look at organic plus unburned fuel uh, on the left-hand chart than in the, in the right-hand chart. So again, these are these are indications, we'll see more data shortly, but indications that not only have reduced the particulate mass, but we've also begun to change the, the nature of that. And, and some of the other work that Dave has done clearly shows that with high and low sulfur fuel, you can turn the sulfates on and off. Much of the particulate that you find downstream of the, of the filter really is uh, sulfate. Jerry Liu in our lab has done some similar uh, compositional studies. And again, uh, to make it easy to see, uh, we made bars the same and scaled them to, uh, to 100, but there's a 99% mass reduction uh, going from left to right. This is some work that he did that Dave Kittleson was also involved in uh, back in 2009, uh, looking at a 2007 engine with and without a particulate filter, measuring upstream of the particulate filter and downstream of the particulate filter. Uh, so the bar on the left is what was going into the particulate filter, and you can see that 
The lower light blue uh, bar is the elemental carbon. Uh, the hydrocarbons are in purple and the sulfate up there at the top uh, is in yellow or whatever color that turns out to be. Um, and then after the trap, you can see there's mostly sulfate with small amounts of elemental carbon and, and hydrocarbons, in fact, less than you would anticipate uh, from the previous chart. Um, so this is, again, another indication of the substantial shift in the chemical composition of the particulate, not just a reduction in the mass. Tom Hesterberg looked at, uh, at other compounds in more detail. Uh, some aldehyde emissions, uh, for those who aren't really close to this, that characteristic old diesel smell that you get from the traditional diesel engines without oxidation catalyst and particulate filters, those are the aldehydes uh, that you can smell in the exhaust. And so you can see the substantial reduction in aldehydes. Again, the traditional diesel in blue on the left, the, uh, the new technology diesel on the right. If you look at polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons, again, most often associated with health effects, you see, again, a substantial reduction from, uh, from 80 to 99% to uh, reduction in, in these compounds. Again, the numbers will vary around here. You'll see on this and on some other charts the magnitude of the numbers, but we are, we're sort of at the levels of detectability uh, for a number of these, uh, these compounds, and so the, you'll see some variation in the measurement. Um, only under duress will I read this entire chart to you. Uh, but I, I, the, only, the point of this is that these aren't just a few casual observations. Uh, there's a comprehensive body of, uh, of information and data in the literature now that, that really documents the change in the chemical characterization of the exhaust uh, with the new technology engines, with the uh, Ultra low sulfur fuel, the wall flow, and the and the catalyst. This uh, this is from a paper done by Jerry Liu. I think uh, all modesty aside, the facility that Cummins has at our Stoughton, Wisconsin uh, research facility that Jerry Liu operates uh, is one of the finest, if not the finest, in the world for doing chemical characterization of the exhaust. Uh, Jerry has made a career of this. Uh, we've made a substantial investment in it because it's important to us to know. Uh, as we are doing things to manipulate the exhaust chemistry that we're moving everything in the right direction. Uh, and so we've used this facility over time to look at the effects on emissions of NOx adsorbers. And if we started to do very different NOx chemistry in the exhaust because nitroaromatic hydrocarbons are things that have been identified in the past as being, uh, being of concern and, and uh, some of them are mutagenic. And so we want to be able to track that to be sure we're not cooking up things that, uh, that we would prefer not to be. And so Jerry's, uh, Jerry's research documents that we have been uh, reducing these compounds across the board. He did some work recently uh, in collaboration with EPA and we discussed with the Air Resources Board technical staff looking at dioxins and furans in exhaust with copper zeolite catalysts in the SCR system because there's some, there was some concern about whether with copper in the exhaust and heavier hydrocarbons, would it be possible for us to be able to make dioxins? And that's, that's stuff that we're interested in, too. And so we've invested in this facility. Uh, Jerry has been operating and published widely. Those of you who are active in the field, I'm sure, do know Jerry and are familiar with his work. Uh, and he's documented the, uh, the results of using these particulate filters. And pretty much across the board, we're seeing numbers like these. Uh, so. Uh, if you just scan down the list, the single ring aromatics, the higher polynuclear aromatic hydrocan uh, hydrocarbons, alkanes, uh, and the other mix, uh, nitro uh, polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons, which are important, uh, elemental carbon and organic carbon, all of those have been reduced uh, substantially, and again, significantly affecting the chemical nature of the exhaust. So in conclusion, the new technology engine specifically those that are operating on ultra low sulfur fuel and operating on, on, uh, with oxidation catalysts and wall flow particulate filters have fundamentally different and significantly better, uh, if you're going to be different, it's better to be better, uh, significantly better exhaust characteristics in traditional engines, more than 99% reduction in particulate mass, chemical, chemically different uh, particulate composition. The next statement may seem a little bit gratuitous and it is not intended to be, and I'm very serious about this, that the best emissions policy and technology come through effective and deep collaboration 
uh, between the government regulatory agencies and industry, and that is something that I think we have enjoyed, I've certainly enjoyed over time feeling like uh, that we were partners in developing these uh, regulations and technology and not, uh, not adversaries during the course of the event. Of course, to be sure that we meet the needs of our customers, because once again, the only way to get low emission technology in the marketplace is people buy it. Uh, and so that's what we're here to recognize today and to, to be able to celebrate. Uh, and I, I certainly appreciate your attention. We will, uh, I think, we can take some questions on this part because we're going to shift gears uh, in a significant way when Jay gets up here and talks about some of the, the animal studies. So if there are any questions about the engine technology, sort of keeping in mind that uh, we've got another part of the presentation to get through, uh, I think we could take time to take some of those now. And let's get the mic around because we got people online as well, so we may be getting some questions online. Yes. Yeah, this is Bill Dean of Cali PA, and you showed how the the mass uh, is decreased and the number of particles is decreased. Do you know anything about the total surface area of the particles that get out? Um, I don't, Bill. I uh, one of the things that we're struggling with a little bit is you know we've all had this traditional view of diesel particulate. You know the old John Johnson scanning electron microscope that shows the carbon core and then stuff all around it. it doesn't look like that anymore. And so Dan Greenbaum has been after me for six months to draw the new picture of diesel particulate. What's coming out is mostly sulfate. So to the extent that it's really, really tiny, the surface area would be high, but where it, since it's sulfate, it's not that it's not that big a deal. If anybody's got a good idea of a sketch for the new particulate, though, Dan would be glad to hear from you. Yes, hi. Thank you for a nice presentation, you and Herner with the uh, ARB. I was wondering. Oh, that was your data. <laughs> yes. Well, all of our all of our data. Yeah, I've got some uh, questions about that. We're done. Right? <laughs> I'll be around. I was wondering if you could talk about failure rates and, main, uh, and deterioration rates of these after treatment devices, and also what you're doing to make SCR work at low temperatures. Okay, sure. So two things on the the failure rates. The reliability of these has been pretty good. You know, anytime you put a new part out in production, we like for it to be perfect, and we do our best for it to be. And some of them break from time to time, but we have not seen anything. Uh, you know, particularly significant. One of our motivations these days, of course, and one of the things that saves us from having broken parts running around the road is OBD is a lot more comprehensive. I didn't get into that today, but as you well know, that's been a big theme of, uh, of the development work uh, that we've done. So as we've stepped along, you know, as we went to EGR valves and EGR coolers, uh, you know, we had some teething issues with those. Uh, particular filters, really not so much. There have been some, uh, if you don't control the regeneration well, and so if there's some parts of the controls that allow too much soot to build up before you get into regeneration, then you can melt the filter. And so we see some of those in some applications and have fine-tuned the controls around that. But generally speaking, I think we're, we're feeling that we've had pretty good success. I know the warranty rates, if you, you know, you can, you can look at the cost of coverage for Cummins engines if you look at the annual report, you can see those have been uh, coming down pretty significantly. Uh, even over the last couple of years. So I think we're, we're okay on that front. With selective catalytic reduction, you know, the important thing is to be able to do thermal management. A big part of, uh, of what we've done with the SCR system development, and we really had to do for particulate filters before that, was develop a thermal management system that would allow us to maintain, maintain heat in the exhaust at low ambient temperatures. Um, it's particularly important for a particular filter because you can, you can plug them up uh, and then the engine stops running and you have the failure that we were talking about. So the combination of variable geometry turbochargers, uh, flexible timing with the fuel systems um, has really allowed, and, and exhaust gas recirculation, EGR control, lets us do a much better job of managing the temperature in the exhaust. We can do a particulate regeneration at 40 below zero. Um, and so we can, and we can also maintain uh, the temperature at a reasonably high level for SCR systems uh, over the operating range. So some of the things you hear back from Europe that, uh, you know, the, the vehicles that were in city service were not using uh, urea because the exhaust temperature never got, uh, got hot enough. You know, we sort of anticipated that over here, and so we have the thermal management systems that allow us to do that. We have some data that I think we've shared with you guys before. I can I can send you some. I imagine there's some industry data as well. But if you're if you're interested in pursuing that, I can show you some Cummins data over the operating map and 
uh, over a range of temperatures that show the, the SDR conversion, but we're seeing, you know, 80, uh, 80 plus percent NOx down to relatively low ambient temperatures. Yeah, oh, yeah uh, ARD. Um, John, the current standard for NOx is 0.2. What are the prospects for diesels uh, being able to meet 0.02 NOx? 0.02. Or something. I don't want to encourage you too much along these lines. <laughs> <That's what I'm laughs> or something in that, in that range. Yeah, I think that um, we're at point two. Some of it gets back to John's question that, uh, you know, at, so you've got to do it over a duty cycle and you've got to really anticipate the range in ambient conditions. So if you want to look at a uh, genset that's running at steady load, that you can really dial in the SCR system, you can get quite high conversion rates. but. If you've got to worry about startups and um, a transient operation over a wide range, then I think it's hard to get that high integrated efficiency. So we can take a look at you at it with you. You know, we'll we'll see numbers below 0.2, but I don't know uh, what 0.02 would be like. But you know, I don't think we're going to be looking at 0.01 particular when we started working on this either. So. Uh, I, so I, it's hard to say no. I, I think we just ought to take a look at it and also understand now the trade-offs between um, NOx and greenhouse gases because as we tend to drive the particulates, the criteria pollutants further and further down, that continues to take more energy. So if we have to do things like more aggressive thermal management, that'll take energy, it takes fuel, and then that makes it harder to hit the CO2 target. So I think what we're going to be seeing going forward now is that how do we strike that balance between the concern over CO2 and greenhouse gases and the criteria pollutants? With a three-way catalyst, you're in a whole different ballgame, but as long as you've got oxygen and exhaust, it's hard. Yes? Hi, uh, Bob Wynn, uh, ARV. On one of the slides where you have the particulate matter composition breakdown, uh, are, we, are we seeing a, a, a net increase or a net decrease in the sulfate emissions? It's kind of Difficult oh, it's a net decrease in the sulfate emissions. At, at, at 10 ppm sulfur fuel, the sulfate emissions are quite low. So the, it's just everything else is so much lower that when you look at the pie chart, it looks like the sulfate emissions, they're a bigger fraction of a much, much smaller pie. So the, the net sulfate emissions are really quite low. Uh, you know, with a 15 ppm sulfur fuel, you're looking at something more like 10 ppm in use. Of the so they're, they're extremely low, but if you're looking at the solid particle, the composition of that, it's, it's a big question. Hi, Steve Mikowski, Dow Chemical. Um, the data you've shown today is pretty impressive from the uh, engine technology and the after treatment technology. I think most of the data of the new technology diesels had wall flow particulate filters. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not aware of certifications yet, but there's a lot of talk in the press of the non road uh, tier four final, uh, some applications coming out without particulate. How do you think that would impact some of the data that was shown, such as reduction of PAHs and particle numbers? It's a real good question. Certainly the mass emissions would be low because they would meet the, the uh, emissions standards. Uh, to be honest with you, I think we need to take a look at the composition of those, uh, of those particulates uh, to understand how the breakdown uh, changes. I would expect the sulfate fraction to be higher. Uh, because the, higher, the carbon content is, is lower and with the use of oxidation catalysts, you do eliminate a lot of the uh, lighter hydrocarbons. It's just a question of whether or not you get a significant hit on the heavier PAHs. 